Hola amigos, episode 11, Sweatshop Book Club. This week, new book on the block, The Language of Coaching. Very, very new. The Language of Coaching, subtitled The Art and Science of Teaching Movement, Nick Winkleman. When I first looked at this book, I made a thumb through. I thought this looked very textbookish. I thought this would be something that they would teach in university, in undergrad, even postgrad, because uh, this uses and references a lot of studies um, anecdote as well, and, and I would say there's obviously tons and tons more uh, references to studies uh, and research than there are anecdotes, of course. And when I first started reading it, I almost thought this is leaning a lot on research, which isn't a stab because I think that that is good if we're looking at case studies uh, as well as things that apply to the art and science of uh, teaching movement. I, I think that there's a lot of validity and uh, reliability when we're looking at uh, research case studies and the like to ensure that what kind of information we're giving actually is applicable to the situation, aka cueing, using your language uh, to create better movement patterns in an expedited fashion, right? Um, the one thing that I did like about this uh, is that it starts with an anecdote about uh, Coach Nick going to Indianapolis as the head exercise guy for uh, combine training and prep. Uh, he had a bunch of guys go to the NFL combine and his guys ran faster than when they first started uh, with him, but he also saw training where they ran faster than what they actually exhibited at the combine. Uh, so it led to a lot of questions on the plane ride uh, back and lo and behold, uh, lots of research later and lots of um, correlation later, we have something that again, not to be redundant, expedites what we need out of the athlete when we're actually communicating with them verbally. So the best part about this before even opening up, the art and science of teaching movement, this does a really good job of uh, blending the two. Where we're looking at the art of, like maybe we're using analogy, there's you know uh, the chapter in here, analog, uh, there's a whole section for uh, cueing as well, but science as well, again, the aforementioned research and studies that are in here, there's just references on references on references. So uh, if I was a student and this was a textbook, I'd, I'd be pretty into this course uh, if there was a university class that was titled, you know, Language of Coaching or Advanced Cueing Techniques. Um, I think that would be actually super helpful. And I would also agree that um, when we talk about the scaling or even the continuum of cueing going from uh, close internal cueing to um, you know, far external cueing and even getting beyond that into analogy, I, I would think that from what I've seen anecdotally and what has been referenced here in the research that a lot of the coaches use close internal cueing, which is uh, far inferior to most external cueing modalities, right? So um, why don't we just get into it now? Why not, right? So uh, if we're looking at the spectrum, we have uh, close, internal cueing and it goes all the way to uh, external cueing within the realm of what we're looking at as well as uh, analogy. And analogy kind of is an outlier uh, within the continuum um, because it's we're, we're, we're using uh, likeness as opposed to an internal or uh, extrinsic manner uh, for what we're looking at for the athlete to develop cueing language and how they make an adjustment or um, how they stick to something as well, because there's a lot of memory that goes into this as well. So uh, internal uh, cueing, when we're looking at in a close manner, would be looking at a single hinge, right? Um, one body part, uh, and then they're thinking about how their body's moving uh, within a sport, within play, within something of that nature, where we're looking at even training as well, right? Uh, and then we have uh, far internal cueing, and that would be something where we're looking at where our body is in space and time. We're still internalizing uh, the cue, but maybe if I was worried about, you know, um, I really need to extend my knee when I'm driving off and I'm sprinting. Now, um, if that was an internal uh, cue within a close manner, now if I'm looking at a little bit further external, sorry, further internal cue rather, uh, what I'm looking at now is where my body is in position uh, with itself in a global manner as opposed to a one uh, joint approach. So close external um, is also the next portion of that before we get into far external, uh, and this is just the way I remember it as, as well in, in terms of getting close and far, 
Um, but of course, close external will be something where I want to push myself away. Uh, far external uh, will be something where I'm looking at, I want to throw this ball you know, towards something, or I want to jump towards a cone, or I want to run towards that cone. Uh, so I'm putting um, my thought process outside of myself as, a, as opposed to in, inside of myself. So the studies have shown with the cueing uh, and the nature of intrinsic uh, ideals with, within that realm that it's just not as efficient as giving external cues. Uh, if I have a bench press or I'm, I'm dumbbell bench pressing as opposed to barbell bench, bench, bench pressing, I want to push the dumbbells through the ceiling. That will help with a lot of muscle activation that we talked about um, with the EMG studies as well as velocity. If, there, if you guys are doing any VBT, uh, velocity based training, that part is important as well. But the idea also infers that you need to be fluent in whatever um, your athlete is speaking. So if I have 10 athletes, I need to be fluent in speaking athlete A, athlete B, athlete C, all the way down the line um, until L, right? Or J, rather. It would be the tenth letter, I believe. So the idea there also is that if we're using the correct language, we're using correct cues, we see better movement patterns that are more repeatable, but also within the memory portion of this, uh, they're more repeatable. Uh, the retrieval rate of them is a lot quicker, uh, and the cues actually stick. How many times you've been coaching someone and uh, they're doing really well in one session and then they're, they're seeing you once a week and then they come back the next week and we're trying to solve the same problems again. Something's not sticking. Uh, and you would think it's the athlete, but in reality, a lot of it is yourself, right? As a coach, uh, trying to communicate. So communication is huge within this. Now, actually to the portion of the book that we're looking at within the sections, there are three sections. Uh, part one is learn, part two is coach, and then part three is cue. Part one has three chapters, which include within the learn section, learn this, pay attention, and remember when. Uh, learning is priming with the process and distinction. We talked a lot about uh, a lot of the antidote and, and, and how we think and how we um, perceive language as well. Pay attention. Um, I liked the portion about the wandering mind when you're talking to an athlete and all of a sudden they're just not there anymore mentally, um, are they really processing something? Are they trying to ignore you on purpose? How does a brain actually work? Mechanism is a huge part of this, understanding where we're going with how the brain actually functions. All movement starts in the brain as well, so that's a, another part of the cognitive process. And then three, remember when memory as, uh, like what is it, what's long-term memory, um, making memories, things of that nature. A good anecdote that Winkleman brings up is when Einstein is trying to learn how to golf and he goes out and gets a professional golf coach. And the golf coach is saying, okay, uh, you wanna bend your elbow here and your chin's tucked and then on the back swing, you wanna do this when you're coming down, we're gonna, you know, we got this in mind. And he's giving him all these cues, he's peppering him with a lot of cues and that's great. And Einstein gets frustrated after a few, as anyone would, right? And he says, give me a second. Then he walks over to uh, where all the balls are and he grabs all the balls and he tells the golf coach, catch as many of these as you can and he throws all of the golf balls at the same time. And, and Einstein, of course, making the point to the coach that you're you're trying to make me do the same thing. You're, you're peppering me with too many different things. Let's focus on one thing and get really, really good at that before we move on and progress the mastery of how we should be moving. It's a little too much. I would infer from reading this as well as my own anecdotal experience over the last 10 years, and, and my experience as a coach is we're using far too many internal cues. We're talking too much about dorsiflexion and hip extension and things of that nature with athletes that are not uh, well-versed in anatomy, of course, and well-versed in how their anatomy plays in their function of leverages and things of that nature, anthropomorphia as well. It's not important to them. Sport is important to them. Their training at the moment is important to them. So why are we talking in anatomical uh, internal uh, ways when that fashion is just not as superior as talking about perhaps looking at it in a analogy fashion. So uh, I want you to do pogo jumps where you're doing as many successive jumps as possible um, with low um, time on the ground, just over and over again, repeatability. Maybe I say, okay, we're doing pogo jumps, pretend like you're a rabbit and you're trying to get as many jumps as you can within the next 10 seconds, right? It's, things of that nature where we're getting it away from the body, we're getting it outside of the athlete's head, uh, and we're letting them perform for the sake of them performing. 
One thing that I really like in here also uh, within the idea of where we're going with this is the 3D queuing model where every queue should have a direction, it should have a description of course, um, and then it should have distance as well. So a good uh, example of that, like I talked about before, the dumbbell bench press, that's why I brought it up earlier so I can reference it now as well. Focus on smashing the dumbbells through the, the ceiling. Focus on smashing the dumbbells through the ceiling. So the description is smashing, smashing the dumbbells, uh, through is the direction, through, uh, and the ceiling. That's the distance from here to up there. So that is providing the, the uh, a lot of the amount of force that we want to produce as, as quickly as possible. So as we move through this, one section that I really liked, uh, or one paragraph rather than I'm gonna quote really quick, uh, really summed up the book for me on page uh, 189. Um, and the idea is once you believe and trust in these queuing concepts, you're ready to deploy them uh, live within your training sessions. You're ready to freestyle, adapt and apply and use our queuing models in the seconds you have between an athlete finishing a rep and expecting you to share insight that will make the next one better. Having committed to using our models in preparing a session, you're now ready to start using them during one. Over the coming weeks, if you haven't already, I'd like you to start using our principles for queue creation and adaptation in the midst of your training sessions. This means shifting the distance direction of, or description of your cues as needed, creating analogies in real time, and modifying these analogies to fit the needs of the individual by taking the final step you're introducing a central ingredient to making your new queuing habit stick vulnerability. I like the idea that we are giving you a blueprint for you to learn how to queue more effectively, more optimally, but you gotta make it your own. We're not trying to give that information and make you robotic within uh, your regurgitation of the information, correct? We're rather trying to blend this into your own style, but just make you more potent within uh, your coachability. So I thought that was uh, really, really handy. And within this, the other portion that I like is eventually, after we get through all of the science and all of the art and how we blend the two, uh, within a beautiful symphony of queuing, we see that Nick provides uh, us with a lot of the cues that he uses, a lot of the language that he uses to give you kind of like a starter kit or a starter prompt uh, to what we're looking at. So within this are really beautiful designs uh, and artwork in here where we mesh. At reading this, if, if you've ever seen um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, if you haven't, you should. Uh, and if you have, you probably won't ever want to watch it again because it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, but there are pictures of an athlete here and he's doing a single leg RDL and there's a chain. He's like coming up and he's trying to break the chain. There's like kind of like art, artistic drawing in here, some graphic design in here. There's a lot of effort put into this and it looks great. The book looks great. I'm into that. The aesthetic is, is 10 out of 10 would recommend, right? Um, so the last few, I would guess from page 200 onward, um, there are some some informational tidbits here and there, uh, some pages with a lot of text, but the mo most of it looks like uh, a lot of this, right? And I really appreciate that uh, Nick takes what he thinks in his mind of a cue. Uh, for instance, uh, we got a guy with uh, blades in his hand because he wants to make sure that the blades are going up. Imagine your forearms are metal blades like the T-1000 Terminator 2 and cut through the air. Another uh, reference to a movie. I would watch Terminator 2 again. Good soundtrack. Um, but it really translates what he, what Coach Nick thinks in his mind and <laughs> adapts it to a, uh, an art form in here. It's, it's really, really interesting. So again, this was heavy pasta for me. This was definitely something that um, took me a while to read. I tried to read a chapter uh, a day. Um, and within 10 chapters, it took me longer than that which is rarely the case with a lot of books. I want to read a chapter a day. I usually breeze through it pretty damn quick. Uh, but with this, I had to read things over and over and over again, um, because again, there were a lot of, there were a lot of referencing the studies. There were a lot of uh, blending different studies together to make uh, good coherent points that would correlate with each other. And also, it's just a lot of really good information, right? And, and I think again, that whether you've been coaching for 53 seconds or if you've been doing this for 20 years, how, how much of that has really been um, quality, right? And, and that's not a stab at anyone uh, in the win either, but um, it could be better. And I think that this would, I think that this book 
tremendously enhances what you're already doing, if not simply affirming what you have been doing, right? Some of the stuff you'll read and you'll say, well, that makes sense. Obviously, that's pretty uh, common sense. But then Nick describes a mechanism for why that is so, and it makes it so much more robust and so much more clear. And that's something that I really appreciate within his writing style. So 10 out of 10 would recommend. I wasn't expecting uh, to like this book when I first started it, I'll be honest. It was, again, heavy pasta for me, but I liked it. Uh, I'm glad I finished it. And this is something that will be overly um, reference when I go back to it to try and figure out, you know, what I was thinking, what I saw within a session. So I would, I would like to say from this one, thanks for writing this because this is, uh, some of the finer side and more, the, more the finesse of what coaching is as opposed to just reference sets. This is a uh, connection on a, on a human basis. And that's, I think what is lacking right now. So ciao.